everyone. May I introduce today Sydney Picasso. Um, I've known Sydney for many years, and let me give a brief about who Sydney is. Sydney is a writer, art critic. Actually, she's been writing. She has been writing essays for my for my artists, and and also she's an archaeologist. If I miss out anything, Sydney, please let me. You know, you can elaborate. Okay, I'll put that hat on. <laughs> you know, my hard hat. One question I always wanted to ask. Yeah. You are, you know, you're writer, critics, and archaeologists. I mean, how does this whole thing、uh, gel together? Okay, well, I I can say that archaeology is a science, and that's the first field I studied after French. And when you arrive in an archaeological field or site or so forth, your idea is to identify what, where, why, how, and by whom. So. In contemporary art, when you come up against a Damien Hirst or something really odd, you do the same process. You question. But then, when you look at art, because because there's a lot of people is oh, you have to read the concept, you have to look at art and identify which is good and which is, and how do you? I never read the cartels in the museums. First of all, I don't like people telling me what's happening. I just look with my eyes, and then, and sometimes I go to an exhibition. I'll go in the back first. So I don't like this idea that I'm being led through something and that I have to be told what's. It's really about your eyes and not about your brain at that point.、Mm. So as、um, as you you are the daughter-in-law of the Pablo Picasso, so how much of his work has influenced your work? Well, I think he first of all. Picasso influenced everyone in the 20th century because he was so omnipresent. He, Sort of a negative way with the abstract expressionists because they all wanted to go against him. Nobody could get around Picasso, since he lived so long, from you know 1881 to 1973. He was a hard act to follow, and his、um, he also would say, you know, I don't, I don't search, I find. I don't look, I see. Yeah, that was one of his famous sort of hackneyed statements. The other thing is that. The rumor is that his first word was lapis, which means pencil in Spanish. That he wanted to be, and his father was an artist, as everyone knows. But he wanted, he was drawing when he was a baby and fo- following his father and so forth. So, I think that's very important. And his eye, you know, he wrote a lot of texts calling el ojo, the eye. As you know, he made photography also.、Mm-hmm. He made sculpture, but the eye is so leading in what he does. He doesn't think. So you、yeah. and and you and your your ex husband Claude、mm. have been writing books about Picasso, right? And how about、oh. this book as as I was as if I were a signature?、Yeah. Yes, that's it's actually the title is in French because it comes from a statement by Picasso because. You know, traditionally, it was David Douglas Duncan, the photographer, who photographed. Who was the first photographer really allowed in Picasso's studio? The first photo you remember is he's in the bathtub, and Jacqueline takes Picasso's naked、yeah. in the bathtub. But after Duncan stopped working there, there was a an Italian Spanish photographer named Roberto Otero, who I met very late in life through one of the Miro children, and he. Was allowed because I think his wife was、uh, related to a Spanish poet, something like that. But anyway, so Picasso had this great nostalgia of Spain because he could not, he did not go back after Franco was in power. So, but he loved anyone who spoke Spanish. So you know, Dormar, etc. But he.、Um, So Otero was allowed in. He's actually the last photographer that was allowed to photograph Picasso,、mm. and he did some amazing things. So, at one point, there was a big sort of a photograph of, a, of the I think it was a photograph of the tapestry of Guernica or something like that, and he said to Picasso, "Could you stand in front of this photo- photograph?" And Picasso said, "I'm going on the left as if I were a signature." So that's、ah, what. So he's the so, signature so to his. So that's how the name as the. That's、uh, the title of my book. Yeah. yeah. So so now has this book been translated in English? Not、enough? not yet. No, it was translated into. It's it's in a collection from、uh, Ashet, which was is more poetic, 
writings and so forth. So, um, and the, 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 the person who asked me to write the book, first he wanted me to write something about Picasso and his poetry. And I said, look, Picasso did th a lot of things that we don't know, we didn't know until he died. I mean, we knew about his sculpture, his painting, his ceramics, but we didn't know so much about his writing. And there were volumes of writing, wow. both in sketchbooks, but also just in manuscript. And very famously in 1930, when he was sort of at odds with his first wife, Olga, he said, I will never paint again. I will become a writer. And as you know, he was friends with all, you know, yes, with so Paul Eluard, Apollinaire, yeah. and so forth. He was obsessed with writing, and some of his writing is amazing. So the, it, uh, the sketchbooks that had writing in them and were unpublished were published by... Um, I think it was the Pace Gallery, Arnie Glimpscher, that got a hold of most of the sketchbooks. So there's a book of, which is called Je Suis Le Cahier. So it's the same kind of thing as, as if I were a signature. It's on the title of one of Picasso's sketchbooks, it says, I am the notebook or I am the sketchbook. Wow. Because he was so indissociable from his work. How I mean, wonderful. he did nothing but work. Oh, let's talk about drawings. For you, is uh, you have, you have really, um, you are an expert in drawing. So, so let's talk about Picasso. When he was fourteen years old, um, when he was studying in the Barcelona Art School, and he was known to be talented mm -hmm. in drawings. Do do you think that his drawings mean opened the way for you to understand Picasso's work, or or was it really an important thing? I think I I think it's difficult to understand his work without his drawing because the drawing is every every drawing is dated and sometimes it's dated Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. He was very very scientific about everything he did and not, he, he didn't sign a picture till it get, came out of the studio, but sometimes you see on the back of the paintings even Sunday the 10th of August 19 this and this and this. So um, it was really, he was very specific. He wasn't just running around, you know, doing what he felt like doing. And then in the sketchbooks, what you see is one day he'll be doing something very geometric with lines and dots. And mm. you've seen these sketchbooks. Some of them are points and, and lines and points. And then the next, he'll, you'll have a very academic drawing, completely beautiful of some, a face or you know, either Olga or Jacqueline or Françoise, which you see on the cover of this Pompidou show. And at the show that's presently at the Centre Georges Pompidou is basically sketchbooks, drawings, pages from um, sheets of drawings, projects for sculpture and so forth. And there was also an issue of whether sometimes um, a sculptor or an artist will draw a project on paper and then he'll make the sculpture. Picasso made the sculpture, then he made the drawing. Really? Yeah, yeah. Sculpture he was all, first and then draw? Yeah, he would draw the sculpture. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting, but he was always working. I mean, as you know, he didn't, he didn't, he woke up around 11 or 12, read the newspapers, went to the studio around 11 or 12, 13, you know, uh, one o'clock. And then he worked until all night, as you remember. You see pictures of him yeah. working with with lights and so forth. But he, I mean, he was, he did nothing but really work. And I don't think that the women in his life, I think he loved them all, but I don't think they were. They kind of substituted his, yeah. his drawings. Yeah, and they, his were, they were subjects. It was as if he were looking at the amused. lamp and then he'd draw the, the faces. And he found, I mean, it's always been said that he loved Francoise's face because it was like a Grecian sculpture or Jacqueline also had this very classical face, you know, and Dora Maar always had two faces in a way. So wow. it's interesting. Some, there are a lot of composite drawings or, and paintings where it's partly Marie-Thérèse Valter and partly uh, Dora Maar when he was going between both of them. And you are with the Royal Drawing School, right? Yes. And you're doing the ex external assessment. Assessment of board, exactly. So now, you know, Technology, the whole world is evolving. What do you think about art? I mean, drawings. Mm -hmm. I mean, in relationship to the next generation of artists, is drawing still important? Well, I think it is, and I. So you know, I've told the story about the present King Charles, who was Prince Charles, is obsessed with drawing. He draws himself. Clarence House, you see his own drawings, but he founded the school because here in France we 
still teach life drawing with models in the Ecole mm -hmm. des Beaux-Arts and in a couple of studios that are around or you can hire a model, you know. In England, they don't, in the Slade School, in the Goldsmiths, no. they don't teach life drawing anymore. So he started the drawing school almost more than 20 years ago with life oh, models. I yeah, that. yeah, yeah. It's been, it's been, we celebrated the... Um, the uh, 20th anniversary about three years ago, but it was re we've re he renamed the school to the Royal Drawing School because instead of the Prince's Drawing School, because it became fairly apparent he would be king. Mm. So they're not going to call it Prince, yeah. Yeah, so, and as you know, uh, Queen Elizabeth and the royal family has an amazing collection of drawings at Windsor Castle that if you know what you want to see, they'll take out. So, and so when you say the external assessment board, okay. what are you assessing? So we're assessing the work of the drawing year, which is a postgraduate program. You have to be accepted to be in it. Most of the kids, uh, they're, they're from the age of probably 19 to, we've even had 30 and 40 year olds, but most of them are quite young, but they've already graduated from a drawing school, Central St. Martin's, you know, all the schools yeah. in London. And, um, but they did not learn drawing. And so they have this need to draw. But today's art world, mm -hmm. you look at a contemporary art world, drawings mm -hmm. is nearly extinguished. Well, you have some artists that you only know their drawings and not their, I mean, there are some, there's some really great de Kooning drawings that you, that he did before. Um, there are a couple of artists that um, that that only do drawing, but we haven't, you know, since the '90s, the young British artists. We don't really pay yeah, attention because, with categories. Absolutely, because nowadays you saw more installation mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. drawings, mm -hmm. more performance art than drawings. So, so do you think that the next generation of artists, artists um, would still do drawings and how does drawings play and play into, I mean, the school curriculum? Well, most of the, I think most of the artists and these, so these kids came to the drawing school for two reasons. One is that in Hollywood, in spite of all the technology, there's still a storyboard and it's still done by hand. Wow, really? Yeah, yeah. Still done by you can't do a storyboard without you know with filming instructions without that so they've had to come back and draw and then there are a lot of other things like when people are making decorative art look at the fashion world yeah 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 most of the great the designers have to draw you know they can't just take a photograph of a dress that's not made you know so. Uh, what do you think about art itself in the school curriculum? Is it in an important? Oh, I think so. I think so. And they, they stopped teaching art classes and st stopped in the eighties when there were a bunch of uh, social problems mm. in Paris, including bombs, and they wouldn't take the kids out to the Louvre and so forth anymore. But they they've started doing it again. But I think it's really important to take kids, and you see in London, in the National Gallery, you see these groups of kids sitting in front of one painting. I think it's absolutely fantastic. The, the kids have to look at real. They have to look at the past, the present, and the future. I, I grew up without without museum, no. without seeing well, things, yes, because you, Hong Kong, yeah. we did not anything Yeah, like but you had way. great calligraphers, no? Uh, at the time when we, yes, yes, we have a, yeah. we have a, we have a, we have, have a, a we have one museum, which is calligraphy. Yeah. You're yeah. absolutely yeah. right. You do go, you have go fantastic. In. I mean, in that, I think is I've seen through different cultures to learn to do calligraphy. You have to really practice. You can't just, you know, it's something that my son took a class with Hassan Masoudi, who's Iranian, but he learned calligraphy when he was 12, you know, and so. It, when you write, when you write Chinese, don't you have to really know how to hold the pen? Yeah, you can't. Of you can't you have to make a patience. You cannot have your hands hmm. shiver. Yeah. And on this topic, I want to ask. I would like to ask you and Claude has been collecting Chinese mm -hmm. art and Chinese furniture. How does this all, all happen? Well, we you American. It was our French, and then Chinese. It was our. It was really our great passion. First of all, my aunt. My second cousin was Brooke Astor, who created the Astor Court at the mm. Met. And she, my, my father was from a diplomatic family, so my father grew up in Asia, and she grew up in Asia with her father, you know, and they were sometimes posted in the same embassies. But she, she was in Suzhou. She brought the court from Suzhou 
that's in the Metropolitan Museum I in New saw, York. That's, I saw that That's pavilion. my cousin oh. that did this. People don't know because she was it called. It was amazing. Yeah. Because it was a courtyard with the mm -hmm. pavilion, with the Chinese mm -hmm. pebble yeah. uh, a floor. It was a absolutely No, she brought amazing. the workers. She paid for the workers because she was... She was married before her, her maiden name was Russell, as mine is, but she married um, uh, Vincent Astor, who died quite young, and she, he said, you're going to have so much fun spending my money, and she brought the workers from Suzhou to build the court in the, in the Met. And, you know, all those big Chinese cabinets she donated that are there, and so we started, we were... As, as French citizens, we were allowed to go to China after 1980, after 79, right? So, so I, then I, got, I, I was, I did have a French passport. So we, Claude and I went to China with nine other people. You went to China? So in 19, uh, 1980, 1979, 1980. Wow, with a Dennis, group of just nine after Mao Zedong passed away, yeah. it was raw. It was, it was empty. No food to eat, and no. all the food was pretty awful. Well, it, yeah, but it was so exciting. I mean, we went, God, Tiananmen it? Square, was, there was, it was quiet. There were no yeah. cars. There were Everybody only bicycles. Everybody was in mouse clothes, yeah. bicycle And everywhere. the grandparents were selling little things on the side of the street. It was wow. incredible. And so we went to, you know, to see all, to see the warriors because they were just digging them up yes, there. Yes, yes. And, and um, there wasn't any protection at all. No. You can touch no, it. And you could see the colors yeah. disappearing. Yeah. So I've been there now several times. So we had an amazing trip in China. And we were on the on the train, you know, from uh, from Beijing to to, um, to Sion. And it was, you know, they have the couche dure and the couche molle. Because you it was the tray. French, the Orient Express. So the couche dur. The, the, Excuse me. At the time in '79, yeah. people are no. taking chickens. Yeah, I, I mean, I know. I mean ducks in mm -hmm. and into the no. tray. Mm -hmm. There is nothing called the Oriental Express. No. no, no. But it was a train, and we got on the train, and we were all bunked up like this. But and we were black because of the soot coming out of the train. But it was so exciting. I mean, I can tell you, well, we just what loved an experience. It. And, and we went to an archaeological site called Bampo, which is not too far, which you don't really see when you're on the sort of usual tourist trip through China. But we love the idea that, you know, the Chinese furniture, the joinery, that everything yeah. can come apart, how yeah. people travel yeah, with trunks. It. And we bought a lot of uh, pieces from uh, the dealers here who had had either post-colonial families mm. or... We had some things copied, We, but we had, you know, all of those Chinese trunks are so wonderful. I mean, it's really... Picasso mm, is mm, also mm. interested in calligraphy, the Chinese mm -hmm. art of calligraphy. Mm -hmm. I can't see any of the this influence in his paintings. Well, if you Can look you... at his drawings, though, you'll see. I mean, he had an incredible script. And he would make these. If go to the show at the Pompidou, it's fabulous. I will, I will, yeah. I will. I didn't know no. that even, I mean, I... I just realized mm -hmm. that he was mm -hmm. interested in calligraphy. Mm -hmm. No, he had pens and pencils. I can see he, because most of the drawings he did were in what we call India ink, which is really Chinese mm -hmm. ink. But he would just take the pen, dip it in the thing, and make the drawing. I mean, he was so talented that he could do that. And he always covered the page. He didn't, like, leave this empty or do this here. He just, wow. the entire page. It's incredible. And that's what my my son is the same way. He, when he was four years old, he was drawing. But he wouldn't... He, but your son, son is a sound artist, right? Uh, sound and images. He's called, it's called... Um, what is it? It's called uh, digital, uh, digital practice, video new. digital practice. I mean, he makes... He, he composes music on a computer, he plays music, but he also creates images. So he studied, you know, he has New a couple media. of doctorates in this and that. He's, but that's what kids are doing today. I think it's called digital media practice or something oh, like okay. that. But yeah. But he's an artist as yes, well. Yes, he's an artist as well. Yeah. What is interesting is your son doesn't even carry the Picasso name. Well, he, he does. Officially on his passport, he's called Mr. Yeah, of Picasso. course, but when, but when he's in practice, he doesn't want to be linked with the grandfather, which is pretty well, respectable. Yeah, I mean, he. Yeah. I'll tell you the story of Picasso. So in Spanish, um, Picasso, the father was called uh, uh, Huiz Blasco, yeah, 
and the mother was Picasso Lopez. So Picasso already started by throwing the rules away because Picasso, he would, he, we would be called Ru Ruiz Lopez, Ruiz. actually. So Jasmin thought this was very funny. And I think Blasco is probably a variation of Basque, something like that. So he thought Blasco was very funny. And, but he managed to go through art school without people really questioning him and so Amazing. forth. Yeah. So, and he also has a very interesting, you know, first name, which is the name of a flower, which in the 17th century French artist, Hyacinth Rigaud, pictures that are in the Louvre, Hyacinth, Jasmin. So we named him Jasmin, like and that. Another, mm -hmm. another question I always wanted to ask you is, sometimes when I call you, you will say that, oh, I'm going fishing. I'm going to write a book about fish hooks. <laughs> First of all, um, it was it's because of the son of George Bozelitz, Daniel Blau, who you know, yeah. and for whom you've written a text also. Yeah. Um, Daniel was is very German. He was born in Berlin with when his father, when the wall was up, and he grew up in fairly poor situation. But he, they then they moved to Dresden, mm. and Bozelitz never had very many means until he. I think the the German artist came out like in the early 80s. So, and I had met Baslitz then, but um, I was on a train going to one of the Baslitz shows, and I see these two people, and I look, and I, who are they? And he his, he married an American woman who's from Hawaii, who went to Punahou with Obama, and so he got drawn into Hawaiian prehistoric art. So he oh. said, ah, oh, you know be really interesting. You come with us to Hawaii. And I've done a lot of sailing in my life, especially growing up in the Atlantic, but also in Greece. So he said, come to Hawaii. We're going to, we're going to go and see some petroglyphs on the big island of Hawaii. And the petroglyphs are engraved in volcanic lava, oh. sometimes still warm. Oh, so it's the, it's the question of danger and so forth. But my specialty, so you know, I was advanced standing in French, but I came to France and I got my degree to teach French. And then I um, got into the Ecole des Hautes Etudes and studied archaeology and went in the field in Brazil. But my specialty was rock art, so art which is in caves but visible by light. And I spent eight years climbing around in Brazil looking at that, and I photographed. Explain that uh, uh, no. again. Rock mm -hmm. art. Yeah. So is rock? Mm-hmm, on rocks, yeah. Well, the you know, the most famous... My professor had done her thesis is Lascaux, the cave of Lascaux in France, which is a masterpiece. Picasso always said, I'm Lascaux. I painted Lascaux. But it's a cave that's underground. It was discovered right at the right after the first war, second world war, excuse me. And um, it was intact. So people had hadn't gone and pillaged it and so forth. So they this kid and his dog went into this cave and they saw these incredible images of of bulls and horses mm -hmm. and figures. There's very little human figuration, but it's a masterpiece of art. So I was able actually, when I was still working in archeology span to visit the first Lascaux. Um, right. but, but I've been in almost every cave in France. So visiting up, you know, up, and you can go in at night or it's the same temperature all the time. So, but when I worked in Brazil, there, there are no uh, cultures, you know, there are no temple cultures in Brazil. It's Everything is in wood. But the, the artists would go and create things on, on lagoons, which have these sort of rocks hanging over, and they would just paint things. So that was my specialty. And you just look at something, it's the same thing with identification. And since I was the photographer, I phot photographed, you know, hundreds of these things. What is the relationship of looking at a rock and then being fascinated with fish hooks. Mm, okay, I'll tell you. There's a direct link <laughs> to this, but the I mean the when we say rocks, it's rock art. So it's actually figurations, either on cave caves lit by day or night. You know, so you're either in a cave or outside a cave. But people, it's it's a bit like you know when you go somebody goes and tags a building today and says Leroy was here. That's what they're doing. They're saying. We were here, and actually, when the first some of the first caves that you visit, the first thing you see in the cave on the outside is the imprint of the hand. That means mm. I'm taking charge with the hand, and then you go in and see these animals and so forth. 
So Brazil, which is a very specific culture and no one paid any attention. I mean, archaeologists would be digging for treasure, digging for gold, digging for this. And they'd, they'd sort of say, oh, there are a few little in, indigenous drawings, but nobody paid any attention. And my professor, who had done her fieldwork on Lascaux, which is a masterpiece, decided that we would record all of these. So in one region of Lagoa Santa, Brazil, which is Minas Gerais, which is a, an area where there's a lot of mining and so forth, there were a lot of these caves that were being either destroyed by the mining business or preserved, and we were always negotiating with them. But you, you climb up to a certain level, and then you've got these amazing things, and the sun goes across and everything. And I think, as I said before, Picasso always said, Lascaux, c'est moi. I am Lascaux. You know, because it's it's the primal gesture. How do you get from fascination from from rock art to your to fish hooks? Fish hooks writing about it. Okay, okay. So the the real key is Daniel Blau, who's the son of George Boslett. So as I said, he grew up in Germany, but he married a woman from Hawaii, and I had read, you know, Herman Melville's first four books are set in the Marquesas Islands. And so we went out there together thinking we were going on a great adventure and we would discover Melville's, you know, views and so forth and so forth. And um, we did. We picked up a lot of things on the beach, which are, and, um, but he became obsessed with the fish hook and no one, there are fish hooks in the British Museum. It's a bit, as I mentioned before, people would say, oh, there are a few Indian scribbles next door, but all the archaeologists was, were picking up these fish hooks, but they were, and these are made of dog bone, tortoise shell, oh. abalone shell, um, stone, sometimes wood, and they're absolutely beautiful. It's it's like a stone axe from, oh. you know, from a prehistoric period. A stone axe is never really, they're not trying to make it beautiful. It's a tool, but it's also beautiful. So, and you learn how to chip flint when you're an archaeologist. So. Daniel and, and his wife and I went to the Marquesas and then we went to Hawaii and we've been, he's obsessed with prehistoric art and uh, he has one of the largest collections of fish hooks in the world right now. We've now done two volumes of a book um, on, oh, on them. And he actually, it's something interesting, you know, tortoise shell is now illegal, right? Yes, of course. So he did something very brilliant and I used to wear tortoise shell combs in my hair, but there was a shop here in Paris called A La Tortue, near the Madeleine, I'm sure if you remember this, mm -hmm. where they sold objects in tortoise shell, so combs, brushes, accessories, hairpins. Daniel bought the, 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 the whole lot. The, no, he bought the vitrines, which are amazing to put his fish hook collection in because wow. he's living in Austria now. And you see these incredible vitrines with which were for selling at the auction house for nothing because nobody wanted them because they made them, you know, close the shop. So, but he has one of the biggest collections of all kinds of stone axes, fish hooks. And we've been to the British Museum Keep. We've looked at all the ones they have in the back because they don't even know. He's identified a lot of them for him. We oh. went to the museum and Bishop Museum in Hawaii also has a big collection. We've been up to Oxford. And a lot of these, you know, things, I mean, fishing interests everybody in a way, or we're trout fishing or we're this fishing. I'd never held a fishing pole in my hand. So, but I went, you know, I've, I've been now around in the Colorado River trying to learn how to throw a fish hook or something. But it was the only way they had to survive in those days, in, in the Hawaiian Islands, in the Marquesas. As you know, the Pacific is, first of all, it's much bigger space than the Atlantic. It's hardly discovered even today. Mm -hmm. There are islands you've never, there's a triangle that goes basically from um, New Guinea to Hawaii to um, uh, Rarotoa, you know, the, the Easter Island. That's a triangle and it's huge. Never. No, it's huge. It's a huge space. And and the people would, you know, row out in outrigger canoes. I've been in one of those and, and they'd, they'd actually row out and then they'd row against the waves so that they could come back with the waves. I never knew that you're so sporty. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, it's I'm a big sailor. Sporty, you know, I grew you up ski, in, in the Atlantic sail, Ocean. Yeah, no, you no. sail. And you're, no. Okay, going back to your uh, ex father in law, whom yes. I think is a general interest in and in all of us, is let's talk about cubism. Cubism is a collaboration uh, between 
Brock and Picasso. Do you, originally, yeah, originally, sort of. How? I do, mean, he. Do they influence each other? How does it? They well, happen? they call themselves the Wright brothers. Oh. You know, the the inventors of flying. So, but he had also been in two villages in Spain. One is Horta Diebo, which is the middle of nowhere in the mountains, and the other is Gosor. But in Horta. You climb up to the top of this village, and there's still nothing there today. But you look down at the landscape, and I'm sure he was very influenced. Because don't forget that when Picasso was born, until probably after the First World War, there was no commercial flying.、Mm-mm-mm. So a Gertrude Stein writes amazing text about that when she goes back to the United States. Because she probably came on a on a ship when she first came to France, but she goes back. In the sort of mid '30s, and she sees all the fields, and so then she says, "Well, that's how Picasso discovered Cubism is because he was in an airplane or he saw the fields." And but no one until what 1921 had really seen the Earth from the、wow. sky, if you think yes, of it, yes, yes, except for birds,、yeah. right? Yeah. So, so that's a and it's a real sort of a quantum change、mm-hmm. in in the way we perceive things. So that's why when he and he and he and Bach knew each other, but they went to a village、uh, which people know called Il Solasog, and they went to all these、uh, around antique dealers, and they were renting houses. But they painted a lot of things together. They were passing canvases back and forth. But I don't think anyone really invented cubism. I think it was something that you see in earlier paintings. But you just, for instance, if you take a nineteenth-century. Painting of Wright of Derby or James T. So they were always kind of hatching out things. But I, but I thought that Cubism is strongly influenced by Cezanne and African art. Also, when I saw、mm. when I was、uh, recently, I'm very interested in in African art. After、mm. I've been to Nigeria, and I saw some of the painters、mm-hmm. um, of the art. I mean, of the pieces. It's it it is like Cubism.、Mm-hmm. My understanding is Cubism has a strong influence、uh, from Cezanne and African art. And what amazes me is recently when I visited Lagos, and when I saw、uh, some old African art, it makes me think about Cubism. So I, I, I always thought that this is this must be the strong influence about Cubism. I really need your your thoughts on that. Well, one thing I mean, everyone knows that it basically because of Andre Durand, Picasso did collect、yeah. African art and Oceanic art. But he, the interesting thing about African sculpture is that every detail is there. You may not see it, but there's always the nose, the eyes. Just, <clears throat> nothing is missing in、yeah. an African sculpture. Yeah, yeah. And there was a shop up on at the top of Boulevard Espai. So Durand went up there, and Picasso bought a lot of things. And in the estate, there were huge volumes. Of African, of, of African art, and also things from Tonga and from、uh, the South Pacific, because、oh, he was yeah, obsessed with this. And Braque also collected. Georges Braque collected African art.、So. And how about Brancusi? Because I saw、mm-hmm. a lot of Brancusi、yeah. sculptures、mm-hmm. has this feel、mm-hmm. of African art.、Mm-hmm. Well, it has a feeling of reducing something to its essential details. Yeah, exactly. Because you don't have things missing with Picasso. So <gasps> take if you take Picasso and Braque. So there was a show at MoMA. I think it was in the mid '80s, maybe '83 or something. There was one. There was Primitivism in '83, but these two shows. But the Picasso and Brac, the invention of Cubism. And you look at a Brac and you look at a Picasso. Picasso's paintings are always finished. He would go like this, whereas、yeah. Brac would be very detailed and so forth. And then in the end, Picasso thought, well, you know, I don't know. For instance, you see Majoli. There's all this writing is introduced、mm-hmm. into these paintings, so Majoli is a reference to a person.、Mm-hmm. But when you see le jour, it's not the day; it's le journal, and it means this is this day. So this is all、oh. the same scientific ideas of Picasso. I mean, not an idea of Picasso, but his sort of instincts of Picasso to make make sure everything is completely correct and finished. So. He always finished the Cubist paintings, whereas Bach would leave, or Matisse would leave a way out. Matisse would be cutting the arms off, or but Picasso, the, the figure is always within the canvas. 
And it's always very, very specific. He didn't need to sign them, but it's fun to go to either MoMA or to a Cubism show and try to guess which is Braque and which is Picasso. Because at one period in time, as I said before, they called themselves the Wright brothers who invented flying. I'm learning right? a lot. Yeah. So, and they, they did this together. It was kind of a mano a mano. And they were buying old canvases in antique places because there was no, during the war, there, were, there, were, there weren't a lot of canvases. So they painted over a lot of things. I mean, 50 years has passed since Picasso died. I mean, he is really celebrated as the great master. Now, with the Me Too movement, the whole world, the whole society that is changing. The women are getting more and more empowered. So the treatment of women today is very different during Picasso era. They are, I mean, how are you seeing this? Because there are talks that, that maybe Picasso will be cancelled in the next, next century because of a different treatment, because at that time it was perfectly acceptable. But when we look retrospectively, we will say, oh, it is not up to today's standard. Or, I mean, it will be very interesting if we, they look in, in into Chinese dynasty, we have harems of women, concubines and all that. But, but with Picasso's love affair, do you think that this will affect him, him still continue to be celebrated? I don't think, I don't think there's a problem in, for, me, for me because it's a visual thing and it's actually, <clears throat> I think that canceling is more of a literary tendency. So we have, you know, this French writer called Louis Ferdinand Céline who hated Jewish people was, and, and he wrote books which for many years weren't published in France because it was very both anti-Semitic and anti -Semitic. everything. And, and of course, he, all the, he was a brilliant, brilliant writer, so it's now recognized. But I think these sort of intermediate periods where for one time you don't look, you know, as I said before, for the abstract expressionists, they couldn't get around Picasso. They wanted yes. to do the opposite, so they reacted. Whereas the 80s artists, and then, so you have the 60s, and then in the 70s, there were all these conceptual artists. So everything was somebody walking around a room or somebody moving objects, you know, all of the Bruce Nauman and all yes, these artists, yes. um, Joseph Kazuth and this and that. And then in the 80s, artists came back and were painting again because they were all art, stu art school students. So that's where you have Julian Schnabel, Miguel Barcelo, George Kondo, Kenny Scharf, Francesco Clementi, and they were real painters, you know, and most of them were art school trained, which wasn't the case. Because it seems huh. that today they are not even looking at whether you're a good artist or bad artist immediate, because, mm -hmm. of, you know, it's a very strong Me Too movement, and all of a sudden, women are asking to be respected. So, of course, you know, all of a sudden people look, look retrospectively, mm -hmm. and or, all, and all artists have great love, love mm -hmm. affairs, and, the, and they see the negative way of mm -hmm. the treatment of women. Do you think this will be important when you look at, you know, like Picasso's contribution to the art mm -hmm. world? Would it be cancelled because, of, because I, of that? I can't imagine. I mean, you can't really cancel Rembrandt or Durer or the great artists of the, you know, if you go to any museum and you see these great pictures, you know, they're still restoring old, you know, p pictures which have slaves, the massacre of the Sabine women. I mean, we're still looking at these pictures in the I remember there are talks about taking away the, away the sculpture of these uh, slave traders mm -hmm. yes. in America. Yeah. No, and also you have a lot of 19th century sculptures where they added fern leaves, you know, on the body parts and so forth, even in the Louvre, then they took them off. But, you know, I don't think if you're interested in art as a passion, nothing can stop you, you know, so it's, uh, I mean, I think that... But I, I actually mm. thought that Picasso's love affair is the way that it also impacted his way of, I mean, his, his images, his way of painting and all that. Well, my mother-in-law, Francoise Gillot, famously said, who's the only woman who dared leave Picasso, said women are either goddesses or doormats. And she said oh, it. He didn't say it. She said it. I love that. You know, I so love people that. love to, to quote these things that are, you know, pretty tricky to get around, but I don't think, I think he was really, 
just he was really only interested in painting, which doesn't mean he wasn't interested in his children because he was always drawing with his children. But I think the only thing he had as a passion, and you read this when you read his writings, he was really only interested in what he was doing, you know, even in the end. And when, so after 1954, when Matisse dies and Giacometti then dies, all of his friends were dead. That's when he starts painting 19th century and um, starts painting like a 19th century painter where he has painter and model, an mm -hmm. artist in his studio. And then he does all what we call the late paintings, which are, you know, painted with house paint. But it's an incredible period. But you see a lot of... Because it's always ever-changing. Mm -hmm. I must take this opportunity to thank you for being the chair lady for the chairman of my foundation, China Art Foundation, for a long time. I'm really, really sad that you've resigned. But I want to talk to you about the China Art and Art Foundation, which is, which is ba basically a, a foundation who... Who wants to introduce and who wants to introduce the right perception of Chinese art to the to the West? What do you think about the China Foundation? How how and how was your feeling about it? I think you've it? done a wonderful job. I mean, we I remember a symposium you organized in in Hangzhou, I think, or and with you had every art historian from you know from the Met from I mean practically Glenn Lowry was there. You know, it was really interesting, but and 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 you brought peoples, we had a lot of, of talks about Chinese culture and poetry, and I, I think that power in China was consecrated. The emperors had to know how to paint, how to draw, how to write poetry, as you yes. know. Not teaching the you Chinese anything. Literati. You know, and they had and they weren't powerful unless they could do all of those things. Do you think that the foundation did make a little bit differences? Oh, I think so. No, no, I think so. I just sort of, I'm sort of overwhelmed with, with my time yeah. and, um, you know. But today, but, which is a very essential critical time of the U.S. and China mm -hmm. uh, conflict. And so how do you think that what you can advise me to build the future of it because you know among this mm -hmm. this 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 situation that I mean I don't even see any Chinese art contemporary art or, or Chinese artists being shown in the West properly really? well, you know I haven't seen I and I haven't seen people really talk about it or in China is also there is a lot of different feelings about USA. So what do you think about this, the foundation? What else foundation can build? Well, I think, I mean, some of the, I mean, because you had an intellectual project, not a social project, right? Yeah, so your exactly. idea was getting people together and to have ideas. And some of, I mean, that the Chinese photo book that was published, I mean, it's an amazing piece of work. And some of the things I wrote for you, Su Xiaobai, Xiaobai Su, and Zhu um, Jinshu, these are amazing artists. And you don't, you know, they're not as well known in the West. They, I think Aquavella has a Chinese artist over I at this art fair, and, you know, that whatever. Uh, that there Chinese, was that, uh, that, yeah, uh, Saint Fan Chi, no? No, 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 no. Is the Chinese artist Wong? I forgot the name. Mm -hmm. He lives in Paris. Oh. And a lot of Chinese, actually, mm -hmm. he's not known, but mm -hmm. uh, all on all the Chinese uh, billionaires all bought him, mm -hmm. and and they all said that he is like the new Zhao Wuji, mm -hmm. but I don't know him. Mm -hmm. She said, well, he's we knew Zhao Wuji because yeah. he was friend. He was very good friends with Matisse. Everybody collected him. I'm sure there were some. In oh, the Joe Chi is a complete different person. I mean, diff a different category. Yeah. He was celebrated in China since when he was mm -hmm. in his twenties, mm -hmm. and he won a lot of awards. Mm -hmm. But this one, I don't, I don't know. But I know a lot of the, a lot of mm -hmm. collectors in, and all those uh, collectors has, they all know him. Yeah, and there's a, there's another artist that the the Rothschilds collected a lot of Chinese art, but back in the 40s and 30s, and you see them in their houses. You know that they they had this fa you know this really fascination with China because you can't no China's never going to disappear. I mean, it's just such an important culture for all of us. It's the great culture cuisine of the world. Cuisine. I don't think food would disappear. That no, is, no, exactly. That is definite. Mm. But I think you know. <laughs> Um, what is the next step is always what is very, I mean, 
that's what I always want to know. What is the next step? What else? What else can we do? Because of course, I mean, there are now more foundations doing what I'm, I'm doing. So I think how to move on next step is very important because books has no longer um, as influential as social media. Right. The younger, yeah, the, I mean, there is a generation of kids. That, there's still a lot of people, most artists still read, but it's true that... Because what, yeah, what yeah. we have to do is to, to embrace the younger generation. And how is the younger generation going to really understand what Chinese art is about? And the whole China, most of the Chinese younger gen, uh, generation, they are more interested in American art because they're all educated abroad. I remember when I went, returned back as well, what do we know about Chinese culture, Chinese art? Well, I think I just, I just had, was speaking to Anthony Gormley, who's doing a project in Hong Kong, and he was so interested because, of course, the British had a very sort of off and on relationship with yes. China. But, you know, I think that inviting artists to go you know, to, and I remember when Miguel was there, also Miguel mm. Marcelo. So, having these artists exposed to a real culture, um, which is it's nothing like America. I mean, we don't have that. We have what two or three hundred years of culture, but you have what thousands, thousands of years of a culture that's very constructed. It's very, uh, con you know, it controlled was very, in an intellectual yeah, very, way. Very, very sophisticated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I've read way. all of these older. You know Chinese texts. I mean, I love. I think Tale you know Genji, more Chinese texts than I do. <laughs> Tale of Genji, which is supposed to, yeah. it's actually Chinese about China, not about Japan. So, Sydney, among all the and all the students of last twenty years that you have beat, do you think any of those will become the next Picasso? And is drawings? Would you recommend to anybody who wants to become an artist to tell them that drawing is is f really a fundamental? For them mm -hmm. to become a, I don't think a it's great fundamental, but I, I know that you can become an artist by doing only drawings, as we were citing the case of Vijay Salmas or people like that. But it's um, I think that the, the passion that one has to do anything with their hands, like Picasso would take this glass and break it and turn it into something. I mean, it's making art out of nothing, really, it's what it is. So we all doodle at restaurants. I'm sure we've, our kids drew, they drew with other artists and so forth. And this whole, I mean, I like the idea of doodling. And Picasso, they, you know, he was accused by Douglas Cooper of doodling when he did his late paintings. He was, they said he was doodling himself off into obscurity, which is not really true. Some of those late paintings are absolutely fabulous. Because like my artist, Mr. Doodle, his doodling is very different than a conceptual artist because he, he built this younger generation, especially with him, with that group of artists. They built a narrative. It's not about a concept. They built no, it's a, a narrative, narrative absolutely. and then they doodle in accordance to a narrative about them, about how they see things, about their life. Mm -hmm. Life is completely of what we are talking about, you know, Picasso or the conceptual art or whatever. I don't. You know, the next generation, what are you going to see about well, I think the next generation? What I always say about, you know, artists, and I've been to see the art schools in Pakistan, I've been in Libya, I've been in Syria, I've been in these places, anything goes now. So today you're either going to stand up and, you know, toot your horn or record, you know, the grass or something. I know. So young are woman. you going to ask, um, encourage the Royal School of Drawing students to use an iPad to draw? They do. They do. Because David Hockney shows they show it's slides. All, it's yeah, all no, drawing, no. No, drawing on the them, iPad. No, a lot of them and draw. And painting on the iPad. No, they, they draw on the iPad. And we show the if you come oh, to really? the school oh. in Shoreditch, they show some of their work on iPads. So and it's not just limited to pencil? No, no, no. I mean, they, oh, but, and it, at the end of year shows, which are twice a year, but the main one, I think, well, if you can come in, uh, I think it's December 5th. You see, they have their little sketchbooks and their drawings, and they have big drawings, small drawings, but they also paint. And we have studios where they can paint. A lot of them are, make films, you know, and they can How show wonderful. a film. They're allowed to show. He, I mean, it's not, uh, and I think that the President King is not going to be as involved. I mean, he'll still draw because he draws all the time, but I don't think, I just think it's important to show that drawing is not a necessity, but it's, it is an integral part of all the other things we can do.
Do you know any artist who's who's a great name, who's a big artist, but who doesn't draw? I know draw. I know artists who don't say they draw, but I don't. You know, that's what I was saying when Picasso, sometimes he makes a sculpture and then he draws it. But I did a project with Richard Serra, as you may know, mm. who's not known for his drawing or his sculpture, his lithography. But, and we asked him, do you, do you ever sketch? Well, not really. But then we went to his studio and he does actually draw and sketch. And he did this project in Iceland with the Standing Stones and he made sketchbooks. And now there's a film of him drawing. So and you'd never think of Richard Richard no, Serra sketching or drawing. At all. He has amazing drawings. I see Crystal, uh, you know, sketch also, and draw, yeah. but Richard Serra. Mm -hmm. Yep. Wow, fascinating! So that's, this yes. is <laughs> surprising, surprising. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's an amazing artist, but he's really he his it's his hand that's important for to him. Sydney. You enlighten me all the time. <laughs> and you always amaze me, Pearl. You are amazing. <laughs>